Good morning. Hopefully you're logging on right now. Good to have you uh, on. I see uh, Brother Mark is on. Um, Brother uh, Nate, Miss Elena, thank you so much for logging on this morning. Looking forward to jumping into a new chapter here in the book of Hebrews. And hopefully you had a good night's rest. And uh, we're ready for this morning. I'm going to do go ahead and do my quick coffee check here. I uh, got my uh, I Love My Daddy mug. And uh, uh, looking forward to uh, uh, jumping in as soon as I... Whew, that's hot. And uh, uh, just warmed it up. Uh, let's go ahead and jump on in. Ho uh, um, ho hopefully we got everyone on here this morning. And uh, we'll uh, start reading here in verse number one already from the start. Uh, Hebrews chapter three, verse number one. Brother Romy, good morning. Thank you for logging on. Um, Hebrews chapter three, verse number one, the Bible says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, in as much he who, uh, who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. Good morning, Miss Bonnie. We're Hebrews chapter 3, verse number uh, 4. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over uh, his own house whose house are we if we hold fast to confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm until the end. And uh, this is a great uh, kind of pivot from where we were at in chapter two. Uh, as Miss, Miss Perry, thank you so much for logging in, get your coffee check already. And uh, uh, this is kind of a pivot from where he was in chapter two because he's kind of taking some of the, if we're, if we're going to look at this as kind of a, uh, a dissertation or an argument. He's taking some of the things that he's brought in chapter two and utilizing them to start off or build his next argument. Now, as a way of review, the writer here is speaking to the Hebrews or the Jews of this time, the Christian Jews. And there was a swelling of Christian Jews that had been, uh, um, that had accepted Jesus Christ. However, the problem was they were holding on to the Old Testament ways while trying to serve a New Testament Christ. And that doesn't, that doesn't work. You can't do both. Uh, now, not to say that Jesus Christ abolished everything in the Old Testament. It's just now we serve and live under grace. And, uh, um, and so uh, in doing that, he's trying to kind of teach them or break them out of some old bad habits. Uh, have you ever tried to break out of a bad habit? It is difficult. Uh, one of my bad habits, and some of you are going to be think this is gross. I get a bad habit of chewing my nails. I just, I just get at these things, and I've almost they're, they're basically nubs now. I, I, I don't have fingers. I have nubs. I chew on these things all the time, and uh, it's a bad habit. I try to get out of it. I did it for almost two months. I, I didn't bite my nails, and it was, uh, it was good. But I tell you what, I found that habit once again. And uh, Brother Jude, thank you so much for logging on this morning. And uh, um, so the writer here is trying to instruct these Jews uh, how to live the Christian faith and how to do so kind of leaving their old lifestyle behind. And uh, uh, in doing that, we see uh, he starts off, he says, wherefore, now you remember yes, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, or maybe the day before, uh, I said, whenever you see wherefore or therefore, you have to find where, uh, uh, you have to understand what it's there for, uh, how important it is for us to understand that he is building on from chapter two. And he says, wherefore, holy brethren, now that phrase, holy brethren, is a callback to uh, uh, verse number 11 and 12 of chapter 2, when he says that he is not ashamed to call us brethren. And uh, what an amazing title that is to be the brother or the family of Christ. 
uh, heirs to his uh, to all that he is. And uh, he says, partakers of the heavenly calling. To be a partaker is to uh, uh, really just you need to divide the word par or part taker. You, you are taking part of all that belongs to him in heaven. And how exciting it's going to be uh, when we get to go to heaven and all that's there is for us. And Miss Megan, thank you so much for uh, logging on here this morning. Good morning to you. And uh, I've been praying for you every morning as uh, she's working there uh, on the front lines in the medical field there. Um, we have uh, verse number, uh, we're continuing on in verse number one of chapter three. And he says this, consider the, and this is an interesting title that we don't normally attribute to Jesus, consider the apostle. Now, to be called an apostle, the, the, the title of apostle means uh, uh, ambassador. Now, there are no apostles anymore. The apostle title has been gone away because you had to be sent out from one, uh, from the one. Uh, Jesus Christ having the capital A apostle is, he is the the ultimate ambassador from the Father. Uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. This giving of his only begotten Son made him the great apostle, the apostle. And so uh, he says uh, that we're to consider the apostle um, as the ambassador for God, the heavenly sender, if you will, uh, we're to consider him. Now, that word consider in the Greek means, uh, 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 and uh, hopefully I don't butcher this, katadien. Uh, it means to fix our attention. To fix our attention. Now, when I say fix our attention, it doesn't mean to break our attention. It means to anchor our attention on him. It means that we wholly keep our attention fastened on him. Remember, he's linking these two chapters together, these two arguments together. So remember, the crux of chapter two was we see Jesus. He starts chapter three with fix your eyes or fix your attention on, and he starts with the apostle. And then he goes on and says, and high priest. Now, that high priest is a calling to uh, uh, chapter two, verse number 17 and 18, as he begins to instruct how Jesus changed his position from being uh, right on the right hand of God to becoming a man, to becoming uh, our captain, our brother, our uh, uh, taking on our punishment, and then becoming our mediator or our high priest, if you will. And uh, um, and so he says, consider the ambassador, consider your high priest. And then he says this, uh, of our profession, Christ Jesus, our profession, this is, uh, has the same connotation as our confession of Christ Jesus. It, it's the idea of where we put our faith in. And, uh, um, and so he says, consider where you put your faith in, in that ambassador, in your high priest, and who he is in person. And it's so very important that we never forget who Jesus Christ is in person. And that's one of the reasons why we try not to take God's name in vain. Uh, taking God's name in vain means to take his name empty, to make it something that is void of any depth. And uh, Jesus is given a name above every name. And so to take his name in vain is to basically uh, 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 almost tread over or to take lightly who he is as a person. And so it's so very important for us to always uh, remember that. And then he continues on, he says in verse 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him. Now, uh, the fact that he is the ambassador uh, of the Father means that he needed to be faithful to him. Being faithful means simply going through even in times where maybe we don't feel like we want to. Um, one, one area about the Christian life that you need to understand is it's not always going to be rainbows and unicorns. It's not always going to be easy street. You're not going to always be blessed uh, as far as uh, uh, with, with money and health and different things. Sometimes you go through the Christian life needy, wanting, struggling. 
and how important it is to remain faithful even through the valley. Uh, Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. And how important it is for us to go through these valleys, go through these hardships, stay faithful to God, uh, even when it's hard. And uh, uh, But we see that Jesus stayed faithful, and it's a callback also to uh, Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane, when he said, uh, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Now, he wasn't talking about a cup of coffee, although a cup of coffee does sound good here this morning. What he is talking about this morning uh, is uh, the cup of wrath. And he understood when he died on that cross, at some point, the father was going to have to turn his back on him. And that was a scary thing for Jesus because at that point, he had never had separation from the Father. He had always been in constant link with him. And so uh, he understood that this was going to be a lot. And not only that, that he was going to bear our sins and our sorrows on that cross. And so, uh, but yet he remained faithful. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And how important it is for us to have that same philosophy and, and, and steadfastness. But then he says, who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now, why would he include Moses in this conversation? He included Moses primarily because to the Jews, to the, to the Hebrews of, of this time, Moses was highly revered. In fact, there, there's very few people that are revered higher than Moses uh, Abraham, David maybe, but Moses was highly revered because he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He gave them uh, this opportunity for freedom. Not only that, but all the many miracles that Moses did uh, in, in separation from Pharaoh and separation from the people of Egypt and how he led them uh, to the point where they can go to the promised land. And uh, so he is contrasting Moses and Jesus here. And uh, we'll get into an application here towards the end. Verse number three says, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. This is interesting that the, the writer here would call Jesus this man. But remember in chapter two, he made it very clear that he humbled himself, became lower than the angels, made himself a man. Good morning, mom, Sharsha Ray. Thank you so much for logging in. And uh, you didn't call me this time. Thank you so much for that. And so, uh, uh, but we see here in chapter three, he is calling him this man because remember, Jesus Christ was 100% God and 100% man. And uh, he says, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Now, there's two things to take note of here. Obviously, he's worthy of glory more than Moses because Jesus is our Savior. However, this is also reminding us that both Moses and Jesus had shown glory to people. Remember when Moses uh, went up in the mountain, he asked Jesus, I want to see you. Uh, or he asked God, I want to see you. And uh, God says, no man can see me, but I'll let you see the backside of my glory as I pass by. And when after he saw the backside of God's glory, uh, he shone the glory on his face. And, uh, uh, and, and how amazing that was, how his face shone. And that was that's always been passed down to generations and generations of the Jews within this time. But you understand on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus the, uh, allowed his glory to be seen, and uh, uh, how Moses and Elijah, they were there, and the, the disciples, Peter, James, and John, immediately began to look at each other and said, hey, man, we should make altars for all three of them, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And the, immediately, right after they said that, uh, Elijah and Moses were gone. And all you saw was Jesus. And the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And I think the writer here is making a distinct distinction here. He's saying this, this one who received full glory and uh, was given credit by the father, this one it receives more glory than Moses. Verse number four says this, for every house is builded by some man. Uh, right now we're, we're uh, streaming from my house. We're 
in, I like to call it my home studio here. And uh, uh, this house was built by some contractor. Somebody uh, uh, put out the plans to build it. Somebody uh, uh, hired a crew to help uh, uh, raise everything up and, and to uh, uh, set all the sheetrock together and, and paint everything and, and install the, all the appliances and the wood and everything that was put here. It, it required some men to put some effort into this work. But it says here, for us to understand, but he that built all things is God. So with that understanding that it takes a man to build a house, it takes God to build everything. There is a, a great uh, a, a great contractor, a great master builder in everything that, that we see. This world was created by God and we were created by God. And everything that we create is because God has given us both the, the know-how and the skill and uh, ingenuity to do so. And so um, he's making that distinction uh, that we can do some things. Man can do some things and some great things, by the way. However, God does all things, and uh, keep that thought in mind. Verse number five, he says this, and Moses verily was faithful. The word verily there means he was truly faithful. He dedicated his life to the service of God and God's people. And uh, he says this, as a servant. Now that's a very important phrase that we need to understand. He says he was faithful as a servant. A servant is never greater than the master. The master is the great sender. The master is the one who builds all things. The master is always in control. The servant just does the bidding of the master with the master's uh, 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 providence, with the master's provision, with the master's power. But the servant in itself is simply just a servant. Miss Mateo, oh, Miss Millet, thank you so much for logging on here this morning. Appreciate that. Um, he says this, uh, that he was faithful as a servant for a testimony of those things which were spoken after. So Moses was faithful for a testimony as, as an example, if you will. Verse number uh, uh, six says this, but Christ as a son. What an incredible distinction here. The son has far more authority. In fact, the son in, in this culture, the son had as much authority as the father. The son, if he put his hand to the signet and was to put down the signature, oftentimes they would put down signatures with using a ring and that ring would, uh, they put it in a hot wax and, uh, and then they would apply it to any letter that was going out. And the son had the same authority to send out, the son had the same authority to, uh, uh, to instruct and to take control. The son had all the same power as the father. And so he says, while Moses had a lot of, uh, uh, had an amazing faithfulness as a servant, understand Jesus had faithfulness as a son over his own house. Uh, while Moses was serving within God's house, uh, Jesus was serving within his own house. It belonged to him. And then notice this phrase. This is an incredible phrase. Whose house are we? Now, I uh, just want to stop right here. This is, if we're not careful, we can skip over this phrase. This phrase is, once again, a callback to chapter 2 when he says, he is not ashamed to call us brethren, part of the family. Um, Moses was a servant to help for things to come. But we are brethren with Christ. We are linked together. Remember, that sacrifice hadn't yet come for Moses. That, second, uh, that sacrifice hadn't yet come for the Old Testament saints. We, when we're saved, the blood is applied to our lives. We are a part of the family of God. There's a song. I'm not too fond of the song myself. 
Uh, my mom used to always listen to it on family radio and uh, it said, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Uh, that, that song, we are a part of the family of God. We are grafted in. We are part of that seed of Abraham that, we, that is mentioned in chapter two. Uh, that is who we are. And he says this as a way of both encouraging the, he, the, the Hebrews of this time and also letting them know the difference between who Moses is versus who Jesus Christ is. And he says that whose house are we? If we, and here's, here's what happens if we do this thing right. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. And uh, uh, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply all of this and, and, and kind of help us out here this morning. Uh, the Hebrews were guilty of putting the old time prophets, the old preachers, the men that they revered, that they heard in history, they were guilty of making them, almost deifying them if you will. And the writer of Hebrews, what he's trying to do here is he's trying to let them know it doesn't matter how great Moses is. Moses was simply a servant. Moses was simply uh, doing the bidding of Jesus Christ, of God. He'll never match up to who Jesus was. We serve a better uh, a master. We serve a better uh, a captain, if you will. And we do that a lot within Christianity as well. Uh, we sometimes put preachers in a position where we ought not to put them. We sometimes put politicians in positions we ought not to put them. We sometimes put our heroes in positions we shouldn't put them. Uh, there is no man that can ever uh, supersede all that Jesus Christ is. Now, mentally we'll say, yes, I believe that. Amen, Pastor. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is, he is deserving. His name is above all other names. Amen. However, sometimes in actions we, we do that. Sometimes in actions we put Jesus Christ ahead. Or oh, I'm sorry, we put other preachers ahead of Jesus Christ. We put other men ahead of where Jesus belongs. Now, I remember, we started off chapter uh, three saying that uh, he said, consider, take long thought, uh, uh, stay fixed on this, that Jesus is the great sender. He is, the, he is the great ambassador. Remember this, that Jesus is uh, the high priest. He is our mediator. We don't need men. We don't need uh, uh, um, uh, to be uh, uh, revering men far more than they ought to be. Now, my position as a pastor is a great position. And I love being a pastor. I absolutely love it. I love being able to serve God's people. But as a pastor, I'm called to be a minister. A minister is a servant. And while my relationship with Jesus Christ is as brethren, I am a servant to his church. I am a servant to his people. Therefore, I place myself as a servant within his work. And honestly, we all, should have that relationship with Jesus Christ that we are brethren. We are within his house as family. However, we serve. And Brother Mario, thank you so much for logging on. And thank, I appreciate uh, you and your family. And he exemplifies being a servant. I, Brother Mario is an incredible man. Um, but if we're not careful, we will lose the, the idea of Jesus Christ coming first. We'll lose that within our eyes. And then when man fails, because man will always fail. Uh, one of the things, someone asked me here recently, uh, why, why does Jesus include all this bad stuff in the Old Testament? How man has failed, how David uh, uh, failed, how uh, all these men failed in their, in their life. To, 
to let you understand that Jesus will never fail. Man will fail you at some point. Man will do something that you go, oh, I'm not sure about. Jesus is always good. Jesus is always right. And that is important. And if we do it right, if we keep our eyes fixed on him and our heart fixed on Jesus Christ, look what he says. And Miss Nikki, thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Uh, but, but look what he says that we gain if we, if we keep our eyes fixed on him. He says this at the end of verse number six, and I'll, I'll finish up with this. He says, if we hold fast, if we really grasp this idea that Jesus Christ is the great apostle, the great ambassador, and Jesus Christ is the, our high priest, if we hold on to that, look what we gain. He says, the confidence, now that word confidence speaks of boldness. Uh, someone, uh, this was years ago, I remember when I was trying to uh, train someone up in how to soul win, and uh, I would take them out and go out, and they said, I'm just kind of a little bashful to talk to people about Jesus Christ, and they said, well, how can I, how can I be a little bit more bold, and I said, read your Bible, uh, develop a relationship, and if you do that, you'll begin to gain boldness in speaking for him, and uh, I tell you what, that was passed on to me by a, one of my favorite preachers of all time, Brother Wally Davis. And I remember telling him, I said, I can joke around. I can be in front of big crowds. And, and uh, I, I used to love acting in high school. And I said, I can, I can act in front of a bunch of people in high school. I could, I could uh, joke around and, and do all these things, play basketball in front of a whole lot of people. But when it comes to preaching God's word, I, I just get so shy. And he says, then you need to build your relationship with him. And that thought has never left me. So he says, if we do this right and we don't put men ahead of Jesus Christ and where he is, we'll have confidence or boldness. And then not only that, but it says, and rejoicing. Now, not simply rejoicing for the sake of rejoicing, but rejoicing in the hope. One of the things that we need so much right now is hope in God. Because if you read the news, you'll find, oh, this more many people has the coronavirus. And this is happening within our politics. And this uh, is an issue. And this person passed away. And it can be so very uh, discouraging. However, if we begin to really put Jesus Christ ahead of man and really focus in on who he is as a person, can I tell you something? We will have hope. Hope in him. And hope in, and, and as it says here, uh, uh, rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. And uh, if you stay faithful, you know what you're going to need in those low times where, where you don't have uh, money or you don't have health or you don't have uh, security or you don't have toilet paper or paper towels or uh, uh, whatever it is. Can I tell you uh, uh, how you make it to the end and stay faithful? You put Jesus Christ first and you gain that boldness. But as you put Jesus Christ first, understand he will give you the ability to rejoice when there's nothing to rejoice about. And uh, I think that's where Paul said it this way in the book of Philippians as he was facing certain death in that Mamertine prison. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. How important it is for us to keep that thought in our mind. I hope this, this was a help for you this morning. And uh, uh, I want to have a word of prayer with you as we get into Friday. Would, can you do three things for me? I went, I, I went to the store yesterday and I noticed three things. One thing I noticed was the way people interacted with each other was completely different now. And I hope we don't lose our, because of this whole social distancing, I hope we don't lose our heart for people. Uh, it, it scares me that we're going to lose, we're going to become so distant from people because we're afraid of what can happen and what, uh, now, yeah, we're social distancing right now from the church and, and that's simply to keep people healthy because we congregate together. However, let, let's not be so afraid of people that we can't be, a, 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 be kind to them and help them and serve. Um, the second thing I want us to uh, keep in mind as I was at the store is let's not be caught up in fear. 
uh, I was, even yesterday, I went to the store, my wife asked me to get some, just, uh, I think I got three things, basil, and, and uh, uh, she asked me to look for paper towels, we were out of paper towels, uh, praise God we found some this morning, um, but I went to the store and I saw this lady and this man, and they were practically wearing hazmat suits. Um, and they had this big mask covered head to toe. Um, and they had four shopping carts full of stuff. Absolutely full of stuff. And I sat there and, oh, I didn't, I didn't sit there. I walked by and I thought, wow, that is so unnecessary. And, and yeah, I understand. Every day seems like there's new news and, uh, and think how things can get, get worse. But let's not get caught up in fear. It, let's, let's just trust God. And uh, uh, yeah, if you need something for the house, get it. But to hoard, to, to grab all these things, that's just fear. Um, let's, and that's greed, ultimately. Uh, and greed is simply the fear of not having enough. And so let, let's... let's not allow that to take control. And then lastly, um, would you do me a favor? Let's pray. Uh, and when I say that, you say, well, pastor, obviously we need to pray. No, I mean, let, let's pray. Uh, pray for our churches. Uh, yesterday, I probably got four or five phone calls from different preachers and missionaries. And, um, you know, uh, let's pray for our churches that, um, number one, we're able to meet again here pretty soon. Uh, pray for our churches financially. I know I, I talked to one preacher in particular who uh, is pretty worried about his church uh, financially making it. Um, pray, pray for these pastors. They're making, we're, and I say they're, we're all making decisions and whether it be a pastor or family, we're all making decisions on the fly. We've never been in a situation like this. But pray for them that, that they're able to have the wisdom and discernment of what to do and how to do it right and, and, and everything. And then just pray also for our government to make the right choices and, and uh, you know, that they're able to do the things that they have to do that's best for the people and not simply for their party or not simply to make them look better. Uh, but let's let's be in prayer and really give ourselves to that uh, this weekend. Tomorrow uh, we'll meet and uh, we'll meet uh, 10, 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, we won't be looking through the book of Hebrews. We'll be looking through the book of First Peter. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that tomorrow. Uh, we'll have a word of prayer and then uh, I'll let you go. Heavenly Father, I thank you now for your goodness to us. Lord, I pray that this was a help for uh, those that are tuning in this morning. And uh, Lord, I pray for, um, uh, Lord, I pray that you would put within us the, the peace that passeth all understanding so that we don't get caught up in fear. I pray that you would allow your miraculous hand to uh, dry up this, this virus within our world. And uh, Lord, I pray for our churches and, and really I should include the small businesses within our communities. Um, I'm thinking right now I can think of just within our area a few churches that uh, I'm familiar with. I think of uh, uh, Bay Area Baptist Church. They, they serve in, in Fremont along with us. Uh, I think of Heritage Baptist Church. They serve in San Leandro. Um, I, I can think of uh, uh, North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara. Uh, there's, uh, I think of uh, just the, within our, our community here, I pray for those churches that, that God would put their hand upon them and uh, keep them safe and make the right decisions. But Lord, also I pray for our small businesses that you would allow them to still be able to find uh, the traffic that they need to come through their, their stores and, and purchase and that they'd be able to maintain uh, their, uh, their cash flow there. And uh, Lord, I love you. Thank you for today. Bless our people. Prosper our way. Give us a wonderful night tonight with our families and uh, bring us back tomorrow for our, our devotion. We love you now in your holy name. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. And uh, I will see you tomorrow. God bless.